All right, welcome everyone to the first episode in the Fossil Projects Fossil Roadshow webinar series. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Jeanette Pirillo, your moderator for tonight. I'm a paleontology grad student on the project. To give a little background, this webinar is part of a series where we will be touring the country and making four stops along the way, showcasing four fossil clubs and their featured fossils. As always, our webinars are being offered as a partnership with the Paleontological Society and facilitated via iDigBio's Adobe Connect platform. There are four webinar episodes in the series. The next will be on Thursday, October 19th, just before GSA, where the Dallas Paleontological Society will present their featured fossils. You can learn more about the rest of our webinar series and the fossil project in general at myfossil.org. Now, before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. This webinar should last no, it should end no later than 8 p.m. Eastern. No one except for the presenters and myself have active microphones. If you can hear us and see the power, PowerPoint, you're good to go. Also, please don't forget to take the short survey after the webinar ends. It's really important for us for reporting purposes to our funding agency, the National Science Foundation, so we truly appreciate your time in taking the survey. If you're having trouble, try exiting the program and re-entering Adobe Connect. Or you may type in the chat box for technical support from our team. Please know that you can type in the chat box at any time, but two to three questions will be addressed after each specimen, and the rest will be addressed once we've gone through all of the specimens. The webinar is being recorded, and both the recordings and the presentation will be made available under the resources section on myfossil.org. Lastly, in case you don't already know, by attending or watching all of the recordings of this webinar series, you can receive a certificate of completion. In order to earn your certificate, you must be signed in with your full name, remain and participate for the entire hour, and be a member of the My Fossil online community. So with that, we thank you all for attending tonight's webinar, and a big thank you to our speakers for sharing their time, knowledge, and specimens with us. A quick overview of how we'll be, have structured this webinar. Our format tonight's a little different from our previous series. I will introduce our featured club and expert, Dr. Brenda Hunda. Dr. Hunter will then go through the basic anatomy and morphology of trilobites. Next, we will go through each fossil, and the owner of the specimen will give a little backstory on how he found it. Then Dr. Hunter will identify the specimen. There will be a short Q&A after each specimen. Please type your questions regarding each specimen in the chat box. After a few questions, we will move on to the next specimen. After we have gone through all the specimens, we will take more questions from the audience. And now for some quick introductions. Many of you may remember Dr. Brenda Hunda from our Women in Paleontology series last season. She is the curator of invertebrate paleontology at the Cincinnati Museum Center in Ohio and specializes in trilobites. She will be our expert for the evening. We'd also like to welcome our featured club, the Cincinnati Dry Dredgers. They are an association of amateur paleontologists and geologists with an average membership of approximately 230 families annually. They all share a strong interest in fossils in and around the Cincinnati area. With us today, we have club presidents Jack Kallmeyer and three members, Don Bissett, John Simon, and Tom Johnson. We'd also like to welcome middle and high school teacher from Lakeland, Florida. He has joined the Fossil Project and the Dry Dredgers on various activities. We also would like to welcome his class, who has joined us for the live web webinar. Welcome, students. Let's get started. Freda, would you like to start with the anatomy and morphology of trilobites? Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Good evening, everybody. Okay, good. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm just so happy that we all made it here today and that everything is working. And so I'm really looking forward to having a great evening of shared trilobite experiences with you. Um, trilobites are a fascinating group of organisms. They are some of the earliest, most complex animals that we have on Earth. Uh, their first appearance on the planet is at about 521 million years ago, and they ruled the oceans for about 270 million years after that, dying out at the end Permian mass extinction event about 250 million years ago. So as a class of arthropod, as a group, they were very, very, very successful. We know trilobites as having three main lobes, hence the name trilobite, three lobe animal. Um, there's a common misconception that the three parts of the trilobite refer to the head shield known as the cephalon, the thoracic region, and the pygidium or the fused tail segment. Um, this is actually not the case because we are referring to the lobes of these animals. It's actually in reference to the three lobes um, that separate the anatomy of these animals. The central axial lobe, which houses basically the stomach and the alimentary canal of the animal, and then two pleural lobes on either side, which under each one houses the gill and limb structures. We tend to, tend to really preserve the hard parts of animals, and trilobites have a, a calcified exoskeleton that we find most commonly either as growth stages, molts, um, in other words, or as full carcasses, and that is really what we, we tend to see the most. But there are exceptional places of fossil preservation known as Lagerstatten where we actually can preserve either phosphatically or through pyrite replacement um, the the other parts are softer tissues of the animal, in this case, parts like the antennae and the limb structure. So while we can use modern arthropods to help us try to understand what these guys might look like, um, a classic example that most people use around here are going to be pill bugs or affectionately known as roly polies. Um, but we do actually have direct fossil evidence, uh, in some cases very detailed, of what this morphology looks like. Trilobites, being one of the first major arthropod groups on Earth, are very primitive arthropods relative to other arthropods that we know, such as insects and crustaceans and myriapods. And this is highlighted mainly in the fact that they have a lot of segments and that they have very few um, body parts, what we call somites, that have undergone tagmosis. Uh, really, in arthropods, tagmosis is a fusion of segments, and there are two regions of the trilobite body that exhibit this most predominantly. That is the cephalon head part of the region, where segments have been fused together to form sort of a single piece. And then there's the pygidial region, or the tail that also has fused somites in there. The thorax still remain as free segments for mobility and flexibility of the animal. And of course, because these are arthropods, they have um, antennae associated with them, as you can see here, and limbs that, because they are primitive, are pretty much all mostly uniform in shape and function. And so while this graphic is a little bit less detailed than um, than perhaps I, I could tell you about, uh, what you can see is here is that all of the limbs that come in the ventral part of the animal pretty much look about the same and perform that same function. In later arthropods like crustaceans and insects, you can imagine that they have very specialized um, limb structures, some that are used for crushing, um, some that are fused for biting, sucking um, mouth parts. Some that are used for swimming, while others are used for reproductive purposes. Some are used for crushing, like in crabs and lobsters. In the case, because we're dealing with primitive arthropods like trilobites, we simply just don't have that here. But what we do have is that every limb is biramous, in that it has two branches. It has an upper gill-like structure, um, because all trilobites are marine. Um, they need to have a breathing apparatus. And then they have a lower walking um, structure as well, what we would think of as a walking leg um, as part of that anatomy. So each segment 
both in terms of the thoracic segment with the free segments and the fused segments under the head and under the tail um, are going to have similar, um, similar limb structures. One other point on this slide that I'd like to mention before we move on is that um, the mouse section there has a heavily calcified plate that is basically sitting over essentially where the mouth of the animal would be. And this is known as the hypostome. And the hypostome, we're going to see some examples of that tonight, um, has, um, you know, potentially different functions, one of which is going to be uh, helping in the aid of mastication of food. These animals do not have jaws. They do not have teeth. Um, many of them are more in the realm of detrital feeders, that is, they basically eat mud, or very soft organisms like worms. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that trilobites are the first fully sighted organisms on Earth. They have a compound eye that is an eye made up of many lenses, much like that of insect eyes in the case of flies or dragonflies. These eyes evolve and become very complicated and sophisticated, but the lenses are uh, calcified and mineralized, and we can actually do some studies to try to understand what trilobite vision, what trilobite sight may have actually looked like. And so trilobites form a very important animal for us to understand sort of the evolution of sight um, in the fossil record. So uh, when you pick up a trilobite, the very first ones already come with eyes. And later on, in some cases, depending on in evolutionary trajectories, um, some trilobites do lose their eyes uh, and become blind, kind of similar to what you'd see in a cave cricket. Other trilobites take those two eyes and actually make them into a single eye, kind of like a big visor going across the head shield of the animal. They're, they're kind of funky. And some of these trilobites can actually make their eyes um, up on stalks or really, really high so that they have almost 360 degree vision. So they're actually very sophisticated in that respect. All right, so that's a general, very quick overview of sort of the animals that you're looking at. If we had to pick an animal today that trilobites were most closely related to, because they didn't leave any descendants behind, we would say probably the horseshoe crab, or the chelicerate arthropods are the ones that we, we uh, look most closely to for uh, understanding these animals. Fantastic. Thank you, Brenda. And now let's move on to the main event of trilobite identification. Don't forget that you'll have a chance to ask questions after each specimen, as well as at the end of the identification portion of the evening. I will continue to advance slides as we go on. Jack, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I hope. Welcome. Um, this is uh, a trial bite that uh, I found uh, by not looking for trial bites. Um, I find that's the best way, not, not looking for something and then they, they just pop up. This one happens to be fairly rare. Uh, it's uh, um, probably full size, full grown. Uh, you can see by the scale, that little 10 millimeter scale. Uh, overall, it's about two inches long and um, it's upside down. Uh, which I, I kind of like because it shows the, the structure that Brenda mentioned before, the hypostome on the left. It's a little shield-like plate, uh, which I'm sure she'll explain to you. Uh, what I was looking for when I was found this was cephalopods, and this one happens to be laying on top of a cephalopod that I spotted. So um, it was a, just one of those fortunate things. And uh, the matrix is really hard, uh, and so it's not been cleaned out by me anyway because uh, I don't want to damage the specimen. Uh, the site this came from is in uh, the white water, and uh, that's some of the youngest uh, sediments here in the Cincinnatian. Uh, it also happens to be some of the shallowest water uh, back in the uh, Ordovician. So the environment was, um, um, uh, what do you call it, the rough. The water was rough, and uh, you have the, the sediments here are just uh, real rubbly. So to find trilobites or crinoderms, uh, crinoids, starfish, things like that at this particular site is not uh, not very common. So um, I felt pretty lucky to find this. So I think that's about all I can tell you about it. So uh, unless anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm done. Okay, thanks Jack. Everyone can hear me okay? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. So, so it's very heartening to know that you found it in the white water because that's exactly where it should be. Um, uh, I've had a couple of fossil modifications lately that have changed a little bit about occurrences of fossil plaques in the Cincinnati, and so I'm heartened to know that the the tried and true still remain with this trilobite and. Uh, uh, this is a pretty rare animal. We often will find pieces of it, but finding a nice complete one like this and a ventral surface of it with the hypostome in place is actually quite rare. This is uh, Solarinus icarus um, that occurs uh, typically in the Arnheim, Waynesville, Liberty, Whitewater, and Alcorn um, formations of the Cincinnatian. And one of the hallmarks for identifying this particular trilobite is its pygidium. So chirurids, as a family of trilobites, are fairly conservative in their overall morphology, except their tails. Uh, for some reason, their pygidia do a lot of really crazy, fun things and have long spines and spikes. And in the case of this trilobite, the hallmark of it is, um, I think of this pygidium as kind of like a, a rubber glove that's blown up with air instead of having your fingers in it. Uh, it's got a very, very um, stubby series of uh, pleural spines um, associated with that. You can see that there's six there at the end of the, at the, end of the tail. Um, this uh, hypostome is sort of a classic uh, chirurid trilobite hypostome. Hypostomes in this particular family of trilobites are very conservative. So uh, if you gave me the hypostome itself and didn't tell me where it was from, I, I might be hard pressed to actually tell you which trilobite it came from because they all look a whole lot alike. And in life, this, this hypostome would actually be attached, it would be fused to the margin that you see at the bottom there. It's called the doubler, which is the, the margin, the ventral margin of the <coughs> of the cephalon, it actually be attached and fused in place. Uh, clearly in this case, it, uh, it's been, uh, it's been um, separated. So there you go. That's a good one. I should mention, Jack, that now that you've mentioned it, just as a, as a way to say when you found it on top of a cephalopod, um, I'm sure in all of your hunting experience, you know that finding trilobites on internal molds of cephalopods is not an uncommon thing. Um, there's often this association of internal molds with cephalopod, uh, trilobites with internal molds of cephalopods because it's thought that trilobites may have actually gone into empty cephalopod shells for protection during molting or mating. And so it's not uncommon to actually see that association. Yeah, this one, yeah, I assume my mic is on here. The, uh, this one was on the, um, uh, the empty chamber part. It wasn't on the living living chamber. Although I do have another one of these that's enrolled, a little small one that I found in the living chamber of a coiled cephalopod. All right, fantastic. And now just a couple questions from the audience. We had a question regarding uh, how big and how uh, what's the smallest size and what's the largest size you find in trilobites. Looking at kind of the, so if we're looking at the adult phase of trilobites, like fully grown, because they, like other arthropods, undergo a metamorphosis as they grow. But if we're looking at the fully grown phase where they have all of their segments, which is known as the halaspid phase, the smallest fully grown trilobite can be, can be as small as a millimeter. And the largest trilobite that we know of right now is Isotelus rex, and that is um, 70 centimeters long maybe a little bit longer than that. So they have a major range of sizes. Keeping in mind that there's about 20,000, there's more than 20,000 species of trilobites identified, um, and so you're going to see a lot of variation in shape and growth and all that kind of, and ecology and so forth. Fantastic. Thank you, Brenda and Jack. And uh, just a quick note, to get through all of the specimens, we need to make sure that we move just a little bit uh, quicker. So, Brenda, I may interject at some point if uh, we need to move on to the next one, if that's okay with you. 
But we are going to move on to John's trilobite. John, can you hear me? So I'm on. I'm here. Yeah. All right, perfect. So if you want to give us a quick little backstory on your beautiful trilobite, please. Yes, um, this trilobite was found in Indiana in the Silurian um, from a Silurian quarry and uh, specifically from the Massey Shale. Massey Shale used to be called Osgood, but it was recently renamed. Um, this formation is a mixture of shale, limestone, and bryozoan uh, bioherms. This particular specimen was found in a thin lens of limestone within the Massey Shale. And the, on this specimen, the tail is tucked underneath, so you can't really see it in this picture. The specimen is about two inches long. Now, this, I collected this a number of years ago, and it was prepared by Ben Cooper, who does a lot of uh, professional preparation. And uh, for perspective, there's not very many of these found in the Massey Shale. I've been collecting the Massey Shale for almost 40 years, and I've only got six specimens. Now, I'm sure that it's a uh, calamity of some kind, but uh, I'm hoping there's a species name to go along with this rather than just having a genus name. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start off right away by saying that uh, it's going to give it, getting a species name on this one is going to be really tough. I, I agree with you that it is a calamine. Um, and let me tell you um, kind of a little bit about why it's so challenging. Um, to get a species name on this is because calaminid trilobites in their um, thorax and tail morphologies and to some degree in their head morphologies are incredibly conservative. And so if you get a calamine and not something like a diacalamine or a spathocalamine, which is like a little bit more fancy version of these guys, but you get a, a flexi, flexicalamine or a calamine, um, they can be very, very, very difficult um, to tell apart just based on a single specimen. Um, in fact, some of the work that I've done on calaminids has required that I do morphometric analyses on them, looking at measuring them and putting them into quantitative metrics in order to actually differentiate them by eye. Um, I will say that um, I've done some research, a little bit of research on Silurian calaminids, and some of, some of the more common ones are things like calamine um, niagarensis, calamine celebra, calamine vogdizi. Uh, I'm not sure if this is any of those or something completely new, but every time I look at stuff in the Massey Shale, there's ne there is never a species name attached to these. It's always calamine spa. And most um, publications say that, in general, Silurian trilobites from Ohio are very poorly documented. So what this tells me, Don, is that you and I might have some work to do in figuring this guy out. Sorry, I couldn't give you any more information than that. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So uh, we're on to the next one from John. John, can you give us a little story on this? Okay, I'm not sure that the mic is on. Oh, here it is. Okay, the mic is on. Okay, um, this specimen, um, it's a Moroccan Devonian trilobite, and we know the genus. It's Lelithrops. Um Just for a little background, this was um, acquired at the MAPS Fossil Show in Iowa from a guy from Morocco who does his own collecting and preparation work. And I think the interesting thing about this, of course, it, you know, it's got a lot of interesting features with the long genal spines and all the frill around the body, but of course the long projection out the, uh, the front off the head. And I think an interesting discussion would be what do we think the function of that long projection is? Because that's a pr pretty elaborate piece to have added onto a trilobite. And the trilobite must have expended a lot of energy to make it. So it must have a function. So I'd like to hear some thoughts. I'd like to hear some thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, and I will, I will um, preface this by saying that I was very lucky to actually be in the lab of the scientist, trilobite researcher, uh, Brian Chatterton, who described this in the literature. I actually have the monograph sitting right next to me. Um, Wallaceraps trifurcatus, 
<coughs> as it's known, <coughs> at the time that he was bringing these back from Morocco, nobody could believe that these were actually true, particularly given Morocco's infamous reputation of uh, forgery in trilobites. Everybody thought that this was just another example of a pretty <coughs> bold forgery on their part. Um, he spent quite a bit of time convincing trilobite researchers that this is actually a real animal because it is so strange. But when we think about animals that have really um, over-the-top morphologies, <coughs> excuse me, things like the Irish elk with their very, very large um, antler system, or even the modern day like rhinoceros beetle uh, that have huge projections off the front of the animal. Something like this uh, may not be absolutely so weird. So there are three species of Willisorops. Like I said, this is Willisorops trifurcatus from the lower to mid Devonian of Morocco. Um, and there's been a lot of conjecture about potentially what this function was done. As you stated, so perfectly, there's a lot of energy and investment in this structure. And animals don't do that unless it has a very specific and advantageous function for them to basically survive and reproduce. That's their goal. So in this particular case, um, several hypotheses have been um, have been put forth early on. It was once thought perhaps that it might be a sensory apparatus, which is this kind of interesting to think about, um, that it was some sort of a disguise or deterrent uh, for predators, some form of protection, um, as well as also um, a thought. Most of those um, hypotheses have pretty much been um, uh, less favored over time and currently what we have now is the most satisfactory one would be that the trident as it's called served much like the horns of rhinoceros beetle would serve which may have been for digging although in this case they also use it for fighting other males during uh, mating season and when we think about that kind of a structure in male creatures, um, the implication that there's sexual dimorphism in these trilobites immediately comes to mind like to someone like me. And I want to just mention that while there are two other species of Willisorops, there's never been a definitive study or conclusion that um, they're seeing any sexual dimorphism in, this, in these animals. So the, the jury is still kind of really out on what something like this might be for. <coughs> but that... The rhinoceros beetle is kind of the most um, uh, uh, modern way of thinking about these things, and it was not flexible. I just saw the question here. It is a incredibly calcified structure, so the animal would have been wheeled this thing around as it moved around. All right, fantastic. So I think all of the questions that have been asked so far have been answered. Audience, if you have any questions regarding Don's two trilobites, please type them in the chat box and we will get to them at the end of uh, the webinar once we go through all the specimens. Next, we will move on to John's trilobite. John, could you please give us a little backstory, please? Okay. Uh, these were uh, found on in the lower cope here in Cincinnati. Um, like Don, I was looking for uh, uh, crinoid uh, calyxes and cryptolithic uh, trilobites, and boom, this one was more or less staring me in the face. Um, it was identified as, what, from Aspis, uh, and there was two of them. One is pretty much complete. The other one is, is a little uh, side view on it, but uh, I was happy. <laughs> I was very happy. Okay, yeah, so you're right. Um, the, the species of Primaspis that we have in the Cincinnati is Primaspis crusatus. Um, there is another potential Primaspis spa, if you will, one that has been unidentified and maybe poorly described um, in the literature, but really pretty much all references to Primaspis from the Cincinnati region are of the species Chrysotis, which occurs um, in the Cope Formation. 
There's another <coughs> very similar looking trilobite, um, another adonopleurid called Acidaspis. And the way that we can distinguish quite easily between those two genera is that Acidaspis has a long spine coming off of the occipital ring, which is basically on the very back or neck of the trilobite. We have a big spine coming, projecting backwards down towards the pygidium um, on that animal, and Permaspis um, does not. And so right away it's pretty easy to tell <coughs> the two of them apart from each other. These guys are really small. Uh, they don't get to be very large at all. And to find them complete like this is actually quite rare in my experience. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. I apologize. But what's really neat about these particular animals is that they're some of the most definitive examples we have of trilobites in the Cincinnatian, where they're actually using other organisms for some sort of protection or shielding during the molting or possibly the mating phase. You can often find these guys attached to bry treptosome bryozoan branches. Uh, we actually have a lot of them in the in the collections where they're actually stuck on them, um, the hypothesis being that they were, were using these colonies as a way to shield themselves during the very dangerous part of, of molting exoskeletons and, and the soft phase um, thereafter. So, um, very excellent find. <coughs> <coughs> Fantastic. So we have a couple questions. One from George Powell asking, why are so many trilobites found in Cincinnati? Um, actually, there's a very long history of, of um, biodiversity and biodiversification that precedes the rocks that we have here in Cincinnati. So it's not just the trilobites themselves that there's a lot of, of them, but there actually is also a diversity of organisms where we have many, many species, over probably over 2,000 in the, in the Cincinnati at this point. Um, and this is because we are sort of on the, the edge of a major biodiversification event in the history of life that uh, sort of culminates, starts in the in the early Ordovician and culminates sort of near the end of the Ordovician, right when we were about in the Cincinnati. And, and there's just a really ra a radiation of a lot of speciation. And so there's a huge biodiversity here. And in addition to that, coupled with the fact that we have so many different types of fossils is the fact that we preserve them so well. And so because of our um, setting geologically and the way that the rocks were laid down and, pres and preserving most of these animals in rapid burial very quickly, we just have the benefit of being able to preserve them um, in such a beautiful state. You'll see many of these trilobites are three-dimensional um, and articulated. And that's just a factor and a feature of um, how Cincinnati rocks were laid down. Fantastic. Uh, John, would you be able to hold <coughs> the second trilobite as soon as I get your mic unmuted? There we go. Can you hear us? Yes. <coughs> the second piece was just a, what I call mouth plates, the hypostome, found in the same area. Uh, the only reason I found it is after I washed them down. I went over it with a, a jeweler's loop and saw the, the hypostome. And which one it is from a, a, a flexi or uh, whatever, I know it's not isotelus, but I don't know what species it's from. Okay. Um, uh, John, can you, John, can you tell me what formation you got it out of by any chance? I'm sorry, I was sorry. breaking up. Okay, can you tell me what formation you got it out of by any chance? This was also cope. This was also cope. Oh, okay, it's also cope. Okay. The reason why I asked that um, for this particular case is because this is a flexicalamine hypostome. And, um, and we often don't see these guys. John, I know you're very, very good at looking for the small stuff. We've talked about this in our other interactions with the dredgers and how you really like to get your loop on things and really look. And if you're, if you're always going for the whole trilobite and the, the macro big pieces and you'll miss things like this. And so it's, it's, 
most people don't actually see isolated hypostomes that often, unless it's an isotelus, and then that's, it's pretty definitive, and they're big. Um, so this is a flexicalamine um, hypostome, uh, conservative in its morphology with other calaminids. So the reason I ask you uh, where you got it is because different species of flexicalamine are pretty stratigraphically restricted in the Cincinnatian. That is, is that there has yet to be a case, not that there couldn't be, there always can be, but there has yet to be a case in my experience experience where two species of flexicalamine co-occur. And so in the cope formation, just by going with what I know about the stratigraphy and what species are there, this would be flexicalamine granulosa. But of course, that's hard to say definitively unless it's associated with the trilobite. So that's just based on stratigraphic occurrence. We do have one question uh, from Izzy from the ALF Museum costume, and they ask, how do trilobites reproduce, and why are there so many Parnassus? Um, so, okay, so trilobites, well, first of all, let me just start off by saying that we don't have any fossil evidence of trilobite reproduction. But we know that they are sexually reproducing organisms, just like, you know, most other animals on the planet, and that they probably would have had an egg, a reproduction, like an egg that would have formed. Other invertebrates um, and other arthropods, for example, in the ocean oftentimes will basically send their gametes out into the water column and they will be free to associate and then form an egg. Trilobites, we know, we don't know if they did that specifically or not. We know that there is probably an egg phase that would then develop into a larva. The larva have two potential directions they can go. There are trilobite larvae that are benthic and they stay on the bottom of the ocean and they undergo their metamorphic changes into adulthood all the way through on the ocean floor. And then there are other trilobites that actually take their larva and they move up into the water column and become pelagic and they undergo their metamorphosis until what's called the meraspid stage which is kind of like a middle growing phase where they then drop back down to the ocean floor and live um, in the benthic water environment. But as far as, as far as being able to say what actually their mating protocol was, whether they um, just released gametes and fertilized each other's gametes that way, or if there was some direct interaction <laughs> physically, uh, we just don't know. Thank you, Brenda. <coughs> um, and mm -hmm. now, now um, if you could please turn on your mic so that we can go through your Hello. Fantastic. Tom, can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. We can hear you. You're a little faint, so you may want to speak up a little bit. But can you give us a little backstory on your trilobite here? Okay, this is um, Isotelus from the Arnheim Formation. And uh, I've been collecting them for quite a few years now. Uh, but this particular type here I've not seen uh, in this large size. Uh, what I noticed different about it was um, of course, it was buried uh, upside down, and um, so it was extracted uh, in a plaster pod. But uh, its morphology is much different than the Maximus, which is the common isotelus, in that the um, the body is actually uh, equal portions at this large size, where Maximus, the head was much shorter, the pygidium was much longer. Uh, this specimen is nine and a half by five, and if it were a maximus, it would be nine and a half by six and a half inches. So, and it has the eyes are about a third again larger than maximus. The spines are much different; uh, they don't wisp out, but they're very short and faint and thin. So, my question is, what is the species? Yeah. So, hi Tom. How are you? <laughs> So this is, um, I think, in order to, to um, I'm not going to be able to give you a definitive answer today is going to be the, the upshot of this. Um, Isotelus, particularly ones as you
No, you've worked with these much longer than any of us and have seen many more than probably I have ever had seen. Um, are quite rare in um, direct association and so trying to understand the variation and what that means for how we identify species in these particular animals um, actually still has yet to be done. And, and Isotelus has an amazingly long and complicated identification history. Uh, and so just a little bit of background, I'm sure that you're aware of this. Uh, it was first described by Locke um, in 1842, um, and there were uh, uh, the classic example, Isotelus maximus, was described um, by uh, Forstey in 1919. This is the one that we are all most familiar with. There was a, a broader form of, of, this, of, of this trilobite um, described as Isotelus brachycephalus. Um, that was later synonymized or put back in under the Maximus name by, in 1996, and so that was considered no longer, although it had a very, very different overall morphology in terms of its proportions relative to other Maximus, um, it was um, stuck back under there. Uh, there was also Isotelus gigas, <coughs> which this is not, for, to be pretty certain. Um, Isotelus gigas does not have genus spines, and so, and it also has a much longer, more bulleted shape, and so I can say confidently that, that, that this is not the case. Uh, one of the things that struck me about this specimen is the length of the genal spines as well. They're quite short relative to things that we see in Isotelus maximus, or at least ones that I have seen. Um, and so I'm not exactly sure how that fits into what you've seen, Tom, with, um, with other, other um, specimens. <coughs> there is another species of Isotelus um, called Isotelus magistos, which is actually supposed to occur in the Arnheim formation. Um, some paleontologists think that it's actually a junior synonym of Isotelus maximus. Therefore, again, it is not a different species. It's just a morphological variant of that species. Um, th the problem is, is that <coughs> in the original description of um, Isotelus magistos, two type specimens of Isotelus maximus were included as an illustration. So it really actually confused the issue, but the actual description of the specimen in the literature comes from a completely different fossil specimen. So some scientists or paleontologists tend to think that um, Isotelus magistos is actually a real species, and so there's a little bit of a debate about that. One of the things that um, might be interested in looking at to see if, if this does fit the hallmarks of Magistos or something um, you know completely different is <coughs> that in the case of Magistos, the eyes are located further back on the head um, and that uh, the facial sutures, when they hit the anterior margin, they're actually more broad and they're further apart on the head. So those, those are some things that you may want to want to take a look at when you're comparing it with um, Isotelus maximus. Have you come across Magistos at all before, Tom, or thought you've ever seen that? Yeah. Well, unlike Maximus, as, as they grow, the morphology changes. This seems to be very consistent as it grows larger, but uh, you know it's hard to say. I, I haven't compared it with Magistos to see. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know where to begin on that one. And now the biometrics. Um, actually, I could go to the Royal Ontario, and they would probably be more than. Uh, they, I'm sure they would be glad to help with this. But um, the eyes do seem to be a little bit further back, but they are again about a third larger than Maximus. And uh, right, right, and yeah, eye eye size and genal spine size are two features in trilobites that vary uh, through their ontogeny. And so, but once again, it's hard to relate. It's a halaspid, so the proportions of the animal should not be changing that much. They don't under 
they don't undergo much allometric growth when they get this size. That is, is that everything pretty much just gets larger at about the same rate. And so I would expect that this, if this were a juvenile and it has the full complement of thoracic segments, that you might expect to see a larger size eye um, at, at when these guys are smaller and that would then, you know, change in proportion as the animal got bigger. But considering that this is a full adult, um, that may not be the case here. That's really tough to say. I wish I could give you a more definitive answer. We just don't have the specimens here that allow me to be able to do that. All right. Um, we do have a couple questions, but we're running a little bit low on time. Okay. And we have two more specimens to get through. So we are going to push the questions at the end, and we will move on to the next set of trilobites, which are maps. Hey, Matt, greetings. Can you hear I hope us? you can hear me well. Sure can. Um, so. My trilobite here, I, this is a confessions of an amateur among amateur paleontologists. I found this particular specimen when uh, a, a very generous dry dredger handed it to me over lunch. So um, that's, that's the story of the find. And the other story here is uh, I'm, I teach photography and science, so uh, the photography that I used here is called focus stacking. And was able to make uh, uh, a more particular emphasis on on this particular specimen from uh, from the the front of the trilobite and and also capture the way that it's been curled up. It's the kind of the nose to tail um, position of this animal. So it was pretty neat to see it that way, and I'm, I'm thankful that I had had the chance to take a picture of it. Okay, great, Matt. I have two questions for you, um, if I may. The first one is, since you were given to this, given this, do you have any idea about the strata, the layers, the formation that it came from? And number two, can you tell me a little bit about how big it is? So this particular trilobite, I would say it was maybe a meter wide, and then the other part about it, it's. Um, the formation in the My Fossil Forum, I had an exchange, I think, with Jack Kallmeyer, and he indicated uh, a location in, in Ohio as the most likely place. I think Mount Oreb, is that, does that sound familiar? Right, okay. That sounds good. Okay, so like I mentioned previously, with fexicalamines and the Cincinnati, and pretty much almost on a one-to-one -one basis. If you know what strata you're dealing with, you know what species you have, um, simply because they don't seem to co-occur with each other and have yet to be discovered as co-occurring. Um, there's, there's two things that I want to mention here. One is that one of the main features of flexes, calamine species, of which there are uh, three currently in one subspecies, um, so four in total defined for the Cincinnatian, is the genal angle, so, so where basically the back of the head meets and rounds around toward the side, and where there may or may not be a genal spine coming off of the animal. Um, in trilobite, in the flexi species, each species kind of handles the control of their genal spines a little bit differently. Um, and so it's kind of, I will say it's a bit challenging since I can't really see that part of the animal there, um, although I can, I can pretty much make some, some, um, some observations and conjectures about what that angle looks like. It seems to me that it's pretty rounded. It may not have much of a spine there at all, so I'm going to kind of go with that. The other major feature that helps to identify a different species of flexicalamine right away is the shape of the border in the front of the head. So as you're looking at the animal, you can see in the very front, there's the two eyes and the glabella or the stomach capsule in between, and then right above the tail is that arched piece called the anterior border, or the anterior cephalic margin. That arched piece and how it is angled relative to the rest of the head is definitive for these species. So I would need a photograph of it laterally, like turning on its side, so I could see what that margin is doing relative to the rest of the head. If I had a side view of this, I would have no problem giving you an absolutely definitive um, identification on it, but I'm going to give a shot anyway because I know 
this looks an awful <coughs> lot like, and if it is from Mount Oreb, it looks an awful lot like Flexocalamine Retorsa. And that's what I think I'm going to go with. And if I ever a chance to meet you, you can bring this with me, with you, and I can, and I can take a look at it. Thank you. So, Matt, can you give us a uh, uh, sure, quick explanation on this photo, please? Absolutely. Uh, so this second trilobite is actually a trace specimen, um, and it's, it's the location of origin uh, was over at the famous Maysville, Kentucky road cut. Uh, I was out and uh, with a group of dry dredgers, and uh, I came across this uh, this large slab. And it was flat, and I and I recognized immediately that it had a lot a lot going on on it. So it immediately, even as an amateur, caught my eye, and uh, and so I, I took a closer look uh, quickly because uh, because there would happen to be a, a world famous uh, ichnologist nearby, someone who who studies trace fossils. I was able to get a quick uh, a, a quick summary of what what this might. Be and what might be going on in this particular slab, and his his diagnosis was that it's it's certainly a, a trilobite trace. Okay, and that's as far as we got, right? Trilobite trace. Okay, so so it's it's a bit typically so it's a bit challenging to see. I mean, to be honest, it's best if I could actually hold this and look at it in loop. I see. Um, what appear to be scratch marks on the surface potentially, um, and so I would I would probably diagnose this from this picture, knowing full well that it's challenging from a picture that um, you're looking at a trilobite crawling trace or mer uh, moving trace, and um, the ones that we have in this area really are. Um, of like the Cruziana type, essentially. Uh, Cruziana, however, is often um, dissected down the middle. So you can tell me if you can see this feature or not, because I'm struggling to see it. But it actually, because trilobites are a, bi a bilaterally symmetrical animal, and they have sort of two, you know, plural lobes along the central axis, what you'll often see with trilobite moving traces is that the, the in Cruziana, the trace has actually got two lobes that move sort of in concert next to each other. And I really don't see that kind of a structure very well in here. But it doesn't necessarily always have to be there definitively. So I am going to um, put as a as a uh, temporary transitory identification that you have a, a trilobite um, moving trace called Cruziana, and then if we have a chance to meet, I will take a look at it in closer. Who was your? Can I ask you who your ethnology buddy for, buddy was? Tony Martin at Emory University. Ah, uh, yeah. Tony and I work on council together. I'll ask him. Yes, he is world famous technology expert. <laughs> He's a good guy too. Okay, good. Right. Well, we do. there we go. We do have a couple questions, but we only have three minutes, so we'll go quickly. Brenda, if you don't mind, um, do you know trilobite lifespan and when they went extinct? Okay, so we don't understand truly um, trilobite lifespans. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging to explain it in two minutes or less, but there are arthropods that continuously molt throughout their entire life, and then there are other arthropods that have terminal molts. An example being the horseshoe crab has a terminal molt. The males will molt 15 times, and the females only molt 16 times, so that they can get a little bit bigger than the males. And after that final molt, they live a short period of time, and then they die. In the case of trilobites, because we don't know if they can continue to molt afterwards or not, we really don't understand um, how long they may have lived. And because some trilobites reach, um, you know, probably final molting at the size of a millimeter versus others that are, you know, almost a meter in length, and there are physical laws that govern how much you can increase in size during any single molt, it's called Dyer's Law, um, it would suggest to us that trilobites have to molt for, like, you know, continuously for a very long period of time. Uh, but I don't think, if we look at, if we look at something on the order of other arthropods, it could be anywhere from, you know, months to years, but that's just, we just don't have any real data for that. 
Unfortunately, we are out of time, but uh, just a few cleanup things. Uh, Brenda did put together a fantastic resource section, which you can access uh, through the My Fossil resource pages. These recordings will be made available on the My Fossil website, so you can go back, listen in, and, download, and look over the resources to help you out. Uh, just a few quick reminders to take the survey at the end of the webinar. And we'd all like to thank Brenda and all of the presenters for their wonderful specimens. I know that we all enjoyed them. And from the comments that I see below, everyone enjoyed them as well. For those that have signed in with their full name, uh, with their full name, please just include your first name on the survey so uh, when you take it for NSF purposes. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email or a message on my phone and we will see you again next month. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Jack, Don, John, Tom, and Matt.